what is going on today so in today's video i got the chance to chat with john hutchings and we spoke about you know sobriety and mental health and how he went from more of like a bodybuilding style of training to more of like an all-around wellness routine and just kind of taking care of you know his mental health his physical health and a little bit of spirituality as well you know one thing that he holds as a really important value to himself is just trying to make himself comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So you can find him on Instagram at Jonah Hutch and I'm going to throw that below right here and make sure you go and check out his uh, Instagram page so you can kind of get that motivation and inspiration from the lifestyle he leads because he posts a lot of his fitness and mental health stuff all over that page as well. So without further ado, let's jump into this chat and I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did. And one more more thing if you guys are liking these interviews that I'm doing and you want to see more content like this be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release these interviews every single week if not just watch this video and enjoy <laughs> all right bang we are recording so we're here today we got John Hutchings aka John a Hutch we are live we're recording so he's uh you know a competitive physique competitor and he's a personal trainer he's got a lot of insight in terms of mental health but i'll let you kind of give your own introduction tell the people where they can find you on social media and tell them what you're about cool thanks mark yeah it's uh, it's a pleasure being here with you today um known each other for quite a few years now just through the fitness industry i guess uh being in and out of the gyms and uh, yeah, like Mark mentioned, um, I've done six or seven uh, men's physique shows, a couple national shows. Um, don't compete in that anymore, but, uh, but I definitely still um, keep fitness as part of my lifestyle. Um, it's definitely one of the things that helps me get through anxiety in life, as, as, uh, as I'll explain a bit more about later. Um, but yeah, my, my handles are uh, Jonah Hutch, that's J-O-N-A-H-U-T-C-H at gmail.com uh instagram jonah hutch um so yeah you can reach me there give me a follow give me a shout i reply to basically everyone that messages me everyone that writes me comments i like to keep super active and uh and yeah that's that's where i can be reached at beautiful man so you've been a trainer for literally as long as i've known you but probably way longer than that how long you've been a trainer for mm -hmm. honestly i don't i don't exactly recall when i when I really made the full transition to training um, clients, but I've been training myself for, oh, I mean, it's been over 20 years since I've been, fit, you know, hitting gyms and, uh, and playing different, you know, sports and, uh, and hiking and running and, you know, doing all sorts of stuff like that. And then I, I think probably started training people, I don't know, six, seven years ago. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sick. And what made you kind of want to start doing that for a job or, or start dedicating the most of your time to, you know, not just your fitness, but other people's fitness as well? Mm -hmm. Well, I was, I'd always go train with friends. And when I'd go train with them, I'd find myself kind of, you know, giving them tips uh, and, and I'd end up almost training them when we're at the gym. Um, and I loved, and I love, and I just love being in the gym atmosphere. I'm, I love talking to people. Um, you know, I'm, I can be a really social guy. Um, okay. and I just, and I just start, yeah, I just started thinking like, if I'm always in the gym, I'm always training people are always reaching out to me for, for tips, for diet tips, for training tips. Um, I may as well get paid to do it. So, uh, so yeah, I basically made that transition and, uh, and I got certified and then started taking on clients. That's sweet, man. And so what, yeah. what made you so passionate about, you know, fitness in general? Um, for me, it's, it's always been, it's always been an outlet. It's always been, uh, it's always, you know, it's always helped me get through, get through life. Um, you know, I've had tons of ups and downs in my life and I've had doctors, uh, I'm just going to get right into it. And I'm, you know, I've had doctors prescribe all sorts of, um, anxiety medications and antidepressants and i found the the best one was fitness the best one was just you know going to the gym going for a run going for a hike i'd always feel better after it wasn't these like highs and lows and it wasn't uh 
it wasn't like a, a chemical chemically induced like a, a medication that I was taking that would would give me those highs and lows um, so yeah with, you know the anxiety would would come and go and I've you know done a lot of partying in my day and got drinking and all, different things like that and that would definitely make the anxiety worse um, and then I would take antidepressants and then it was just like this roller coaster that didn't end um so so yeah fitness was just an amazing outlet for me just to like just to really find myself um you know i'd always i'd feel great about myself after a workout and it, it, it would be incentive to eat a bit healthier and it just became this whole lifestyle um that i live now and i love it and you know i, I don't drink anymore it's been a few years um and I eat fairly healthy and I still, you know, I don't eat healthy all the time. Like I still, we still have our treats. We still, you know, um, but, but that's the beauty of it. I'm, I, I go to the gym pretty much every day. And if I'm not in the gym, I'm doing something active. Um, that's, that's sick. and yeah, and it's, it's definitely what keeps me, uh, keeps me sane. That's sweet, man. I, uh, yeah. I love fitness for like literally the exact same reason I, you know, I was on medication, mainly antidepressants, but mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not really taking them anymore. I, I had a whack load of side effects and I find that, mm -hmm. you know, fitness is the only one that never really gave me any side effects. I got a little bit addicted to it for a little bit, but yeah. you know, I think I just have an addictive personality. So yes. it's, yes. it's something that you just have to kind of monitor because anything can be addictive, like literally yeah. anything, man. I've been addicted yeah. to video games Fitness yeah, and stupid things as well, man. So oh man, I I get addicted to like checking things on YouTube or like mm. checking Instagram or just the, the most stupid little things. I get, I just get like obsessed with. It becomes this root this like nasty routine that like I keep checking and keep checking, and then sometimes I I gotta like snap myself out of it and be like, you know, what are you doing? Like reset myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know the one the one I guess it's, it's the one healthy addiction is, has been fitness because, um, you know, because it has kept me on track and it doesn't have, for me, it doesn't have to be just in the gym. It doesn't have to be just lifting weights. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, this past couple of years, I've really, I've really, uh, started to use outside more as, as a tool, um, for my mental health. So just nature, um, you know, just, just getting outside, going for a trail run, going for a hike, I uh, just started bike bicycling cycling recently and uh and that's been an amazing outlet as well. Um so yeah. That's sick, man. Were you always mm -hmm. doing like kind of individual sports or did you get into like weightlifting because you were playing like another sport or like how did it kind of happen with you? Like how how did you kind of get into it? Mhm. Mm yeah, good question. Um so when I was like 15 or fifth around 14 15 I was actually I was actually bullied a lot in high school, and uh, and I went to a high school where you know I, I just I didn't really fit in that well, and uh, and I found myself getting bullied a lot, and I was really insecure. I was, you know, I was super skinny, and I hadn't really filled out yet. I hadn't really grown into myself yet. Um, I hadn't really had any growth spurts yet. So I was one of the shorter kids in in all through elementary and then grade eight, grade nine, I was still one of the shortest kids in my class. That's crazy. And uh, yeah, and I wasn't, out. yeah, and I wasn't really, I wasn't really athletic yet. Um, or maybe I was, but I just was too timid. I was just too insecure. I was too scared. I, I did love, I, I, you know, that's not true because I loved running around my house around, I lived in a, in a like low income housing co-op. And in the co-op, I loved playing in the courtyard. My mom couldn't get me in the house. Like I was always outside playing cops and robbers, water, water fights, and just running around chasing. And I was super athletic. So I was athletic with, you know, with who I was comfortable with. But then when I got to like my later years of elementary and high school, um, I don't know what it was, but I was super, super insecure. And then, and then, uh, yeah. And, and then that's kind of when I found out, found working out when I hit like, 15, 16. Um, I think I, I must have seen some flex magazines or something. And I was like, and at first I thought it was disgusting. These guys were just like massive. But then I was like, I don't know what it was that clicked, but I was like, dude, like I want to, I want to be huge. Like I want to be big. Like people are going to be scared. I've, you know, the, the weird things was like, 
I thought like people are going to be scared of me. People are not going to mess with me. Girls yeah. are going to like me. I'm yeah. going to be likable. I'm going to be the man. I was like, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of guys, probably the same story, right? Yeah, so, 100%. so yeah, I started, I started hitting weights a lot. And at the same time, it was kind of the summer of grade 10. I started going through a bit of a growth spurt. Um, I got kicked out of one high school and went to another. I was getting bullied at that high school and, uh, and anyways, a bunch of, you know, bunch of bad stuff happened and I ended up at this new high school. So I was the new kid and, uh, and I was all of a sudden starting to work out and everything started clicking. And, uh, and then like, I just really found myself there and I just fell in love with myself. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with taking care of myself. Um, and it wasn't all, it wasn't all great from then on. There was, you know, it was just, it was still a long road. But the working out was definitely a tool that really helped. And, uh, and, and my family doctor played an amazing role because I'm, I've been so close with her for so long that at first she did give me the anxiety pills and the medications. But then after like years of doing that, she, she stopped giving me those. And she started, when I would go see her with problems, she'd be like, well, have you been exercising? Have you been eating healthy? And she would say, I, I'm not comfortable giving you any medication. I want to know that you're exercising for two weeks solid and then come back and talk to me. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if there's still problems then we'll go over them. And every single time I would just get back to exercising and I'd be fine. I wouldn't need the medication anymore. That's sick, man. Yeah. I, um, I actually, uh, I had, uh, I bounced from, you know, doctor to doctor for a little bit Mm -hmm. because Well, you know, I, at first I like to blame them, but I kind of realized after that, you know, if you have the same problem with, you know, quite a few people, you're probably part of the problem. Right. So yeah, I think uh, I was just going through a difficult time. Right. And I bounced from doctor to doctor and I got frustrated because, you know, the first couple of things they'd always ask you is what medication have you tried in the past? You know, would you be comfortable trying this one? And I just got frustrated, you know, having that experience. And the one doctor that ended up clicking, you know, he kind of gave me a similar experience to what you just said. Like when I, when I first went in to see him, he's Mm. like, okay, like what's your nutrition like, what's your sleep like, you know, Mm. what's your workplace like, how many hours do you work a week? How often do you see your family? And like, Mm. it was like 50 to a hundred questions of just like lifestyle stuff. He's like, how often do you read? How often do you like think about these types of things? Yeah. And I was like, dude, this is my guy. We need this more doctors is, like that. Yeah. yeah we, need, we need more doctors like that. Definitely. I was like, this is my guy, man. He helped me out yeah. a bit. He started, the first day I went to go see him, he gave me two books. He's like, go read these and then book another appointment with me. And I was cool. like, all right, man, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. He's a cool That's guy. That's awesome. That sounds, that, that, that sounds like a good doctor. Yeah. He was a cool guy. I was stunned. Yeah. He's absolutely stunned. I was like, this guy's sweet, man. He's awesome. He, uh, yeah, he really helped me out with kind of creating a little bit more balance in my life. He kind of helped me see like, uh, you know, I was pretty obsessed with work at the time and just working a little bit too much and not really focusing on a lot of other things that, you know, we can't put like monetary values on. So I kind of just didn't focus on them as much because I couldn't Mm. directly measure the value of it. Right. Yeah. So I think, I think it's important to, uh, to not only like, a lot of doctors will just give you medicine to like to mask the problems. Mm-hmm. But I think it's really important. And that's what a lot of people with addiction do with, with their, with their, with what they abuse is they use, use to mask problems mm-hmm. to run or hide from their problems. And I think one of the really important things that we need to bring to light more is like being able to tackle the problems, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and just, yeah. Being able to tackle being able to to find ways around them but you know also being not just not just masking them with 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 you know with other things and then they really don't go away you know yeah do you think that like do you think that people are always aware of the problems that they're trying to mask though no no i don't think that i don't think they always are for sure a lot of people might not even you know, a lot of people go through traumas as children and they don't even know why they're acting the way they do. And it might be related to something they went through as a child. Right. Mm-hmm. And they, yeah. and, and they need, they need to, 
you know, maybe they need someone to guide them through um, realizing what it was um, that creates that created that trauma or what it was that why they are reacting this way 20 or 30 years later. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, And I feel like even if you do know your problem, like for me, I, like, especially I, I kind of knew like there was something up. I didn't really know mm -hmm. how to put words to it. I didn't really, you know, educate myself on you know, dealing with my emotions and, and my hormones and, you know, mm -hmm. my mental illnesses, my mental health. I didn't really learn about that kind of stuff. So I didn't really know how to like put words to it. And I didn't want to, you know, talk about it with people because I was like kind of afraid of people thinking of me differently or something like that. So I kind of just didn't want to speak about my problem, even though I yeah. knew I had one. Right. Yeah. I, th I think, I think it's really cool that um, more and more people are bringing this stuff um, to the forefront. More and more people are talking about like anxiety and, and this kind of stuff, because it used to be, it used to be just like this, people thought it was just this made up thing. You know what I mean? Oh, like just get over it. Like mm -hmm. anxiety. What is that? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And more and more people are realizing that it's, it, it's, it's serious and it goes hand in hand with depression and all these other things. Right. There's times in my life where I was suicidal and, uh, and there's, you know, there's, there, I've had some pretty, pretty, you know, pretty dark lows in my life. Um, but it's cool that more and more celebrities and athletes and different people are bringing this stuff um, to light and, and showing people that like, it's okay to have this stuff and, you know, maybe learning how to deal with it and learning that it's okay to talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. That's, that's, uh, it's, it's pretty nuts because I think that, it's such a it's such a weird gray area even though you know celebrities will talk about it and we'll share mm. those pictures we'll share those videos mm. when it comes down to you know asking for help in our own personal lives that seems to be like where the pride kind of kicks in you know like there's a there's a lot of people even that make fun of you know celebrities that do come out because there was a i think like clay thompson came out or no, it wasn't Clay Thompson. Kevin Love. Kevin Love did. Kevin Love. Kevin Love. You're right. Yeah. Kevin Love came out and said, you know, he suffered from anxiety, and there was a couple people that were kind of after him, like, oh yeah, tell us how how anxious you are making millions of dollars playing a sport, like. Right, but money doesn't solve everything. No, no. Obviously, you and I know that, but like, it's yeah. just kind of it's it's kind of weird. Like even when people do come out and talk about it, they're still like ridiculed for it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Th there are people that will ridicule them and, and that is unfortunate. Um, but I'm sure he, I'm sure he helped a lot more people. Um, you know, so that, so, I mean, that would, that would matter so much more, right. He set up foundations and he's done so many things and he was exactly one of the people I was talking about when I said athletes, yeah. um, it was Kevin Love because I remember he, he came out a few years ago. And, uh, yeah, he's done a lot of stuff for that. So, yeah, that was, that was, I think that's pretty sick. I think it's always sweet when people, you know, speak out. I think it's good when, you know, people can be looked at as like advocates without actually like self proclaiming themselves to be, I think like Robin Williams is another guy like that or, yeah, you know, Chester Bennington, the guy from Lincoln park, like mm. you guys like that, I think are kind of poster childs, right? Poster yeah. children, I guess. Yeah, they they play important roles for sure. Do you, did you have so like you said that you were going through? Obviously, you've gone through tough times, dark times. Did you have someone like an idol like that that you looked up to, or anything like that to help you get through it? You know what? I didn't. I don't. Not that comes to. Not that comes to mind really. Um, yeah, for me, for you know, my it helps. Um, my mom's an addictions counselor. Oh wow. So it helped having her on on my on my team and uh my family doctor is really incredible so I I'm really thankful to have had her. Um and just I've had a lot of friends around me. Um not always the healthiest ones but as the years have gone on I've just I've learned from my mistakes and started cutting out the toxic ones. Mm -hmm. Um and like, like I mentioned before, sobriety has been a really huge one for me. That's probably one of, one of the biggest ones because when I would go out and uh, party and drink all the time, 
Um, the next day I'd be depressed and then I'd be depressed for a week. I wouldn't understand why. And then I would just party again. And it was just this vicious cycle. And the people I was hanging out with, they, most of them didn't really care about me. If I was in the hospital, they wouldn't be there visiting me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I just found I was becoming, you know, I, I was becoming this bad, like father to my dog. I was becoming this bad son and this bad family member and this bad, you know, bad friend to, to my true friends. Um, and so, yeah, I just, uh, that, that was a really big one. And, uh, yeah, for me, anxiety and depression went hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. And I, I didn't, so back to the question, I didn't necessarily have like one person that I looked up to or that I could, I guess the, I had a few people that I could reach out to, but I didn't, there wasn't one like celebrity or one really, you know, big figure that I could reach out to or that I could, that I looked up to not really. No. It was more of like a general like support group that you had just like a good solid foundation, like family and yeah. Like doctor. Yeah, for sure. For sure. How did, how did you kind of, I kind of, you know, like uh, when I first started college, I kind of started to separate, you know, in my head, I had like my party friends and then my real friends kind of like yeah. how you said as well. How did you kind of start to, you know, pick out the ones where you were like, okay, we're probably going to have to start distancing ourselves from this person socially. Yeah. So for me, it wasn't so much like, it wasn't so much a split like white and black like that. Um, it was, it was more of a, you know, some of my, some of my closest healthy friends were also some of my party friends. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, so basically I just had to take that into my own hands. And, and when I stopped drinking, I stopped going to certain places and a lot of, yeah, a lot of friends were asking me to go out and I just, honestly, I had to, I had to just put this off. So I had to flick the off switch and just be like, I'm sorry, I can't go to your, I can't go to your birthday. I can't go to your barbecue. I can't go to that event. I can't go to Canada day, this or that, or you know what I mean? I can't go to your new year's event. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and some people understood and some people didn't. And that was a really good way to weed out true friends, I guess, because the real ones will understand why you're doing it. And I still have a bunch of them and yeah. Okay. So it wasn't more, it wasn't like, like cutting out friends or anything like that. It was more like cutting out certain activities or places we would be more susceptible. And then the people that understood, you just kept them around. And then the people that did, yeah. like, okay, that's who can go then. Exactly. Exactly. I didn't necessarily tell anyone like, Hey, I'm not going to be able to hang out with you anymore. Mm-hmm. It was more like, I just had to change. I just had to change my habits. Mm-hmm. and my lifestyle and then you know the the right people gravitate to me still mm-hmm. and then the yeah. other ones they kind of weren't like hurt by it or anything they just kind of you know were a little bit you know they, they probably just took a step back they probably just got you know kind of frustrated they're like hey you know yeah like, I'm in, so yeah yeah well i found even at the end like even when i first started going sober i i still would i still i had a rough time with it like a cup there was a couple year window where i would still like try to go out and be like, okay, I can go out and be sober and not have drinks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's this saying in, uh, in like AA and sobriety that says it goes, um, you can only hang out at the barbershop for so long before you get your hair cut. <laughs> and so, and it made so much sense to me. Like I'm going to try to be sober, but go to bars all the time. where like, all my vices are there. Like, there's all these girls and my buddies and everyone's offering me drinks and no, 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 no. And finally that little slip up, I might have one shot and then I'm gone to the deep end and then it's going to, it's going to be a really long night. I'm going to regret it. So I just, I just started realizing like, I can't go to these places anymore. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Why? And, and also like when I would go to these places, um, even when I was able to be sober, I was starting to notice that like all my friends and people that weren't my friends when they're drunk, they're like, they're in my face yelling and spitting in my face and stepping on my shoes and yelling in my ear. And they're like, 
and they're like, oh, I'm so proud of you. Like you're, you're, you're doing so great. Like you're in the gym every day doing the grouse grind, this and that. Let's go tomorrow. Like let's go to the gym at noon tomorrow. Like for sure. I want to go train with you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Do you think I hear from them the next day? No way, man. No, man. So like it became just like this broken record. And I was just, I started, I started just asking myself, like, is, is going to these places benefiting my life, my lifestyle? Is it where I want to, where I want to go? Like, is it, is it helping me get to where I want to go? Like my dream life, what does that look like? And does that involve going to these places? Is that going to help me get to my dream life? No, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, so yeah, I started, I started traveling a bit and that was like, that was really huge for me. Um, and at first when I would travel, I would, I would go get tanked. I'd be in Thailand partying and you know, all these wild places having an amazing time. And then after a while of being sober, I was able to go to these places and have sober holidays. And they looked a little different. I'm not going to lie. Like I would yeah. do different things, but I would experience so much more. Like right. Mark, I would, I would, I would go to these like incredible beaches and like hike volcanoes and like go swimming with whale sharks and like do all this stuff that like, if I was still partying, I'd be hung over and I'd be like, Oh, I don't want to go do that. Like, I'm just yeah. going to fire up the party again the next day and go to the beach and go back to the, par go back to the club. You know yeah. what I mean? So I started, I started experiencing like the other side of the other side of life almost. And, mm -hmm. and it's way, it was way better. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's for everyone. Like some people can have a glass of wine and have a few drinks and having an amazing time and sit in a hammock and still do all those things. I, I said I was doing when I became sober. Um, but I know what worked for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like sharing what worked for me because it might work for other people that are having a hard time um, doing what I was trying and it wasn't working. Yeah, man. I think that, you know, it's pretty obvious that some people have like some positive reactions to certain things and some people have some negative reactions. I'm pretty much in the same boat as you. Like anytime yeah. I you know, drink alcohol, I always kind of convince myself like, okay, everyone else has fun while they do this. This is like the social norm. And then it kind of like disassociates me. I kind of get like weirdly awkward and depressed and I just sit in the corner and I stop talking. Like yeah. everyone else, it's kind of like a social lubricant, they say. But it, for me, it like kind of blocks all my gears, man. I just sit there yeah. awkwardly. Like it yeah. just doesn't mix well with my system, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for, for me, it wasn't like that. Like I was the life of the party. Oh, okay. Okay. I was the life of the party. But then what the problem is, like, when I wasn't drinking anymore, I was like... Once I, you kind of left that peak, right? Like once Yeah, you at first, point. well, at first when I stopped drinking, I started, like, not being as good at talking to people and I feeling a little bit socially awkward mm -hmm. because I was so used to being, you know, being drunk and, and, and doing everything that goes along with that. Right. Um, that, uh, that, that I had to, I had to kind of relearn, like, who I was almost who I was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you know, like you're obviously starting to take like cognitive, like, uh, you're like noticing your actions. Yeah. So you're, so you're more like self-conscious about them. And then when you start talking to people, you're like, Oh, should I say that? So yeah. When you're, when you're drunk, it doesn't matter. You just you say, just say it. Yeah. 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 You yeah. Say whatever comes to your head. Right. Right. And you deal with it when it, whatever happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds a little cheesy, but like, in the last few years, I've just, I've just been high on life. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a, I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie now. And like, I do things that like, I still get this, I still get crazy rushes. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, I'll go skydiving or cliff jumping or like mm -hmm. when I go travel, like we do incredible stuff, you know, just wild things that like I never could have dreamed I would have done. That's um, so sick, man. It sounds like you're the perfect amazing. travel buddy, man. Yeah, yeah, thank we're you. We're gonna have to travel, dude. <laughs> sweet, yeah, man. I'm all over it. I'm kind of, I mean, kind of tough right now with what's going on, but like, I can't wait till flights are available soon no again. Kidding, so, uh, you know, so have we you, can get out of here, get somewhere tropical. Have you planned your uh, next trip once this uh, whole thing ends? Yeah, well, me and the girlfriend were supposed to go to Bali um, in October. Mm. We've been there a few times. I was gonna we say really you've been there. there. Right? Yeah, yeah, we've been there a few times. And it's, it's one of our favorite places. Um, it just has a bit of everything. It has like 
just er this little island that has like amazing culture, amazing people, amazing weather, food, surfing, hiking, ripping around on scooters. Like it's just this little like, um, you know, that one of the nicknames for it is the last, uh, the last paradise. Wow. For Bali. Yeah. It has another nickname. It's called Island of the Gods. Um, wow. yeah. And it's just this incredible little Island that I love. And I haven't met really any people that have gone there and not liked it. Um, it's so cheap. Um, there's yoga. There's a, there's a bit for everyone. And, uh, when we were there last, we found this gym. Um, it's like a calisthenics gym. Wow. And they have all these coaches come from around the world and coach there. Um, so in October, me, Amanda and I were supposed to be doing this, uh, like eight day intensive strength and conditioning, um, camp with four coaches from around the, like four of the best coaches from around the world. Insane, um, man. so like one guy that specializes in handstands, uh, one, like all these different guys that specialize in different things, um, that were going to come teach us like an eight day, uh, camp essentially so we're we're hoping it's still going to go on and if it's not we're hoping that it'll just get postponed a little it's still going to happen eventually yeah that sounds insane do you do like uh like fitness or yoga or like meditation retreats often when you travel or anything like that or do you just kind of normally do your own thing you know what well, one of the things about like about fighting the anxiety was um you know we've chatted about this before was that I'm kind of addicted to keeping myself busy now. Yeah. So I always got to be doing something. I'm, I, I can't, I don't really like to just sit on the couch and do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, some people could just sit and like, and enjoy, just do nothing all day. And I would go crazy. So it's kind of the same when we travel. Like I can't really just sit on a beach towel and, and suntan for hours. Like mm -hmm. give me a football or give me like an activity to do. And I could be on the beach all day. But I have to be, I have to be like stimulating myself. I have to be keeping active. Um, so the same goes when we're traveling. Like um, we were actually just in February, we went to uh, Hawaii for a yoga retreat. Wow. And that was incredible um, with this, just this incredible yogi, this, uh, his name's Ryan Lear. And he owns a few schools, one in Vancouver called Yoga, One Yoga for the People. And he's just wow. this incredible human being um actually and he's i think he's he's suffered with quite quite a bit of like depression anxiety in his life as well mm -hmm. and he's found that yoga can really be like an amazing tool to deal with that mm -hmm. um so that was such an incredible experience um doing yoga with him mm -hmm. um so yeah we do, we just that was our first time actually doing a retreat um but we loved it and i'm definitely down to do um more of them and so when we travel we're always looking at you know, we, we, we try to check off all the boxes when we pick somewhere to go. We're like, we want it to be hot, food friendly, and then either a gym or some activities that we can do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are kind of the things we look for. That's sick, man. Yeah. Do you, do you think that you'd recommend like one of those retreats for someone that was still suffering from like anxiety or depression? Like, Oh man, a hundred percent. The yoga retreat. I've only been to one yoga retreat, so I can't speak for all of them. Mm. Um, but the one we did was so incredible. It would just like, uh, it's hard for me to even like put it into a sentence, like how it was, but it was just like being in Hawaii in this studio with like all these windows overlooking the ocean. And you know, this, this yoga instructor, Ryan is just like, so incredible. He just, uh, you know, he had us like chanting. He had us like, but the energy he brought to the room was so incredible. You know, you have to be open-minded for sure. Like I wasn't always open-minded to yoga and a lot of my buddies, a lot of my, you know, bros aren't, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, dude, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to yoga. Like that's, it's too easy or too this and that. And I'm like, oh, okay, come to a hot yoga class and tell me if it's easy. Like, yeah, yeah. I've been um, worked in, in yoga classes. Man. Yeah. Yeah, man. I just got into uh spinning recently. My girlfriend brought me, I just started in January um and then we had we weren't able to go for the last couple months but it's open again um and i get worked in spin classes man it's like i'm one of the only guys in there and i'm just dying i'm drenched in sweat mm -hmm. um but i just let go of ego at the door like and that's that's one of the things i love is like challenging myself with new things now mm -hmm. 
um, not just going to the gym and doing curls all the time because that's that's my essentially that's my comfort zone. Yeah. So yeah. now I almost try to seek comfort um, in in uncomfortable places. Yeah, man. Do you uh, do you listen to Goggins at all? or read any David Goggins? He, he's he's my guy, man. Yeah, dude. That sounded get comfortable. Good. Get comfortable being uncomfortable, man. That's that's kind of where I was going with that quote. That's like he's he's one of my idols, man. I love him so much because like that's what he preaches is like do mm -hmm. something that sucks every day. Yeah, you know what I mean. And and when you get when you start loving that that state of uncomfortableness. What, what's gonna what's gonna harm you what's gonna injure you what's gonna bother you right yeah 100 percent, man he's uh after i read can't hurt me he's the reason i wake up early in the morning man yeah i got i got that book right here actually i just finished it like maybe a month ago and yeah that no like maybe a two months ago but when i first started reading it and he started talking mm -hmm. about like getting up at like three o'clock in the morning i was this like wild. dude that's insane I was yeah. like, I thought it was yeah. difficult to get up at like six, five, six. This guy can get up at three o'clock in the morning to train before work. Like, yeah, I, I can get up at five. That was like kind of the deciding factor. I was like, I can get up yeah. at five, man. Yeah. Well, a couple of years ago, I did this thing. Um, I did this thing where I got up at like four or five every day for a month. Mm -hmm. And it was really cool, man. The experience that like the, what I, what I, you know, I, I'd mostly just go hiking like in the dark or yeah. like do some reading or like just do some, do some morning journaling and stuff. Yeah. And it was pretty cool. The stuff I, the, the stuff I accomplished because like most people would be waking up and I'm already like halfway through my day, you yeah. know? So it was cool. Yeah. yeah. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been doing that pretty much the last couple months, man. I've just been waking up at like four fifty, five o'clock and just take like the first 10 minutes to kind of sit and journal. And then yeah, I throw a little, uh, little good morning on Instagram and I yeah. jump out and do some cardio in the dark, man. I like that like cold, brisk air in the morning, dude. Good for you, man. Good for I, you. Hey, I had a question for you. Um, what do you, do you recommend any, any books? Do you have any good books that stick out? Like, like the David Goggins book, or like you said that doctor recommended two books. Um, mm -hmm. any, any, any books that come to mind? Yeah, well, the two that I was recommended by the doctor were um, Man's Search for Meaning, which okay. is an insane book. It's written by a, he was a psychiatrist or a psychologist, a psychologist from mm -hmm. Germany. He was mm -hmm. a, a Jewish man in like uh, the Second World War, and he was a prisoner at Auschwitz. And yeah. he, from memory, obviously, because he couldn't have written it there, but he kind of recorded, you know, watching, kind of doing like a psychoanal like analysis on the prisoners that were around him, like just kind mm. of understanding their psychology as they went through this camp. And then, you know, seeing them after they had been taken out of the camps kind of have to recalibrate their lives after they have had, you know, been stripped of everything they've ever known. Right. Like their, yeah. their clothing, their belonging, their family members, their homes, their, you know, like it was, as you know, exactly what the Holocaust was like, it's terrible. Right. Yeah. So it was yeah. a pretty powerful book, a little bit difficult for me to get through. And then the other one was, um, the, brain that changes itself and it's about okay. kind of cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy and kind of reconnecting certain pathways in the brain that have been disconnected you know and it mm -hmm. goes even as far as talking about you know the advancements they're making with you know making blind people be able to see again and stuff like that mm -hmm. so just kind of reconnecting pathways neurologically and and uh fixing mm -hmm. not just mental illnesses but a lot of problems that way Okay. My recommendation, the mm -hmm. number one book that I've read in the past like year or so is The Compound Effect, though. Okay. And that was uh given to me as a gift. Yeah. And um The Compound Effect, I'm trying to remember the author's name right now, but 
if you just Google it, it'll be the first one, the compound effect. And it just kind of okay. broke down. Like I've heard these types of principles so many times, but the way that he's explained them in this book just kind of clicked really well with me in regards mm. to just how everything in life compounds, you know, like right. you're about it with money and interest and savings accounts and yeah. stuff like that. But yeah, you know, he talks about, you know, if you compound like a, 200 calorie deficit in your diet every single day just doing that for you know one month two months three months four months huge difference seeing the compound effect of you know just like yeah. little things day by day i like that i like that yeah i like so that because and it's and it's totally true and you could you could you could use that in so many areas of life just like mm -hmm. you know the more you smile throughout a day mm -hmm. The more you force yourself to smile, the more you force yourself to not force yourself, but the more you, you know, Remind say yourself. hello to random people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The more you say hello to random people and be like, Hey, how are you today? Or just like, you know, what you, what you fill your life and your, and your mind with is really what you become. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he talks about that as well with how the compound effect can, and, you know, we always talk about it, how it can impact you positively, but he also talks about how it can impact you negatively. Like if you spend yeah. like four, like he, there's always the money relation. So I'll use something else. Like he'll say like, if you spend, you know, an hour watching TV a day, like how many hours mm. of your whole life have you spent just sitting and watching a TV? Yeah. Like, like just some random, like just sitting there watching like commercials. Like he breaks yeah. it down to just like, okay, if you spend an hour, you're probably watching like 15, 20 minutes of commercials. So like, if you multiply that, like how long do you spend just sitting there watching commercials? Yeah. Well, the big, the big one now is like scrolling on Instagram, mm -hmm. just aimlessly scrolling on Instagram. I bet you most of us, most of society now spends like an eighth of their life on social media, just not even getting anywhere. If not just more, scrolling. if not, sorry, more. if yeah, not, yeah. More. have you ever yeah, measured exactly. your screen time on your devices at all? Yeah, it tells me, it tells me what it, it, it tells every week or so it tells me what my screen time is. Yeah, I forget what it is. I forget what it is. But, uh, but yeah, I, I and that's one of the other things when I'm traveling, I find that my screen time is so much lower. Mm -hmm. And that tells me that, uh, you know, I'm definitely enjoying myself because I'm yeah. not like, worrying about what people are doing back home because I'm having so much fun, right? Yeah, man, hundred percent. And another thing, another thing about the traveling, yeah, uh, another thing about the traveling for me is that I've really noticed is um, we we love going to a lot of like third world countries or countries where they don't have as much as us, mm -hmm. and I find that those are the friendliest people, hands yeah. down. The friendliest people I've met are the people with the least amount of um object of the amount of things, you know. Yeah. They have they have family. They have they just have like such simple things in their life, mm -hmm. but they're so genuinely happy and they're so, um, they're so generous. Yeah, man. Do you think that because I've like, I've kind of spoken with a couple of different people about this. I don't know if it's just because it's a little bit more okay to talk about it or less stigmatized or just like mm -hmm. more information's out about it now. Do you think that more people deal with depression especially in like North America, do you think more people deal with depression than they did before? Like say like 50 years yeah. ago or a hundred years ago? Yeah, for sure. I think pressure. Yeah. I think that pressure to like have more, always more, 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 you know, nicer car, nicer, this nicer that now it's like you get it, you get the new iPhone and like months later, the new one's coming out. Mm -hmm. And like, once you have the, the, once the new one's out, yours is like almost obsolete. Oh, you don't have the iPhone 20. Like, Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so it's just like more, more, more nicer things, nicer clothes. And people are being forced into like racking up credit cards to, you know, we all know this to impress people that really don't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it's one thing I've really let go of in the last few years as well is like the, all the Gucci Louis Vuitton, like all this designer stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I gave it all away. I literally gave it away. I, I went on my Facebook and I like wrote like anyone want a new pair of Gucci shoes. And like, I started giving things away 
Wow. Because I just had no use for it anymore. I don't go, I don't go to those, I don't go to clubs anymore. So where, when am I going to put on, like, when am I going to wear this stuff? Like I, mm-hmm. I do the same kind of stuff every day. We go hike, we go, we go travel, we go like, I'm not going to wear Gucci shoes to like, to like a little third world country. I wear yeah. chucks or flip flops or bare feet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, like, I still do get, um, name brand things. So I'm still a sucker for name brand things, but it's just a different level. Like now I, I do, you know, Nike, Lululemon, and <laughs> it's not like the designer designer stuff, right? I'm yeah. not spending quite as much money. Yeah. Um, and my things last a lot longer now, like I, and I get a lot more wear out of them. So yeah, no kidding, man. So yeah. Do you find, uh, so, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, do you find that like that kind of constant pressure? Do you think that it's, do you think that it's making it easier for people to talk about because it's more of like a prevalent issue or do you think that, you know, it's still something that people struggle with talking about? Like, I think it's something, uh, I think it's definitely still something people struggle with talking about Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And I think more people than we think uh, struggle with these problems Mm -hmm. and just don't talk about it for sure. Did you, did you struggle at all? Like kind of reaching out for help when you were dealing with issues? Yeah, for sure. There were times and there was, and, and, and I would do things to reach. I would do little things to reach you know, that were like, I would for sure do little things to reach. Yeah. Like I would try to, I would try to hurt myself um, with little cuts or weird random things. Mm -hmm. And I'd make sure to tell people about or to have it so that someone could see it. And then people would be like, Oh my God, why did you do that? Are you okay? And I would want people to kind of ask me like, what's wrong or how are you doing or kind of dig. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, um, you, you want to make it like obvious for people so that so someone could kind of reach out to you so you didn't have to kind of take that like first step kind of thing? Yeah, a little bit for sure. For yeah. sure. And I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know how, um, you know, how we can make it easier for people to feel comfortable to reach out, you know? No I think kidding. that's a really important, I think that's a really important step. And I think things like this is cool because, you know, someone might watch it and, and think, yeah, I, that was me as well. Mm-hmm. Um, or I went through that or, you know, and, and lots of people reach out to me on, on Instagram, um, Facebook, and, and they're like, Hey, I'm dealing with this. I noticed that you've done this. And how did you get here? How did you do that? And, and I'm always, I'm always like down to, to tell people my story and share what worked for me. Mm-hmm. And it might not work for everyone, but, uh, but a lot of the time, um, some of it will. Right. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know, really know what the answer is to, to try to, I think, I think we need to teach more about it in school. Mm-hmm. I think that'd be a really big step. I think, um, you know, I think in school, you know, they should add, they should add like, meditation or different things like talking about anxiety and depression and they should talk about it a little bit more i think they probably just touch on it a little bit um, i don't even remember touching on it in high school man yeah yeah and i think it's such an important thing because we almost all deal with it mm-hmm. different people are better at dealing with it than others um but we all deal with it at some point in our life yeah, I'd say if we don't deal with it, we know someone close to us that deals with it, like a family yeah. member or a friend. Yeah. Like, I think everybody, I, like, I don't know the actual statistic. I think it's one in five Canadians is impacted by it. But I think, honestly, okay. I think everybody is impacted by it, man. I yeah. Think that even if you don't deal with it, you know someone, whether it's a cousin, a family member, like a, a sister, brother, yeah. friend, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've known a lot. Of, I've known quite a few people who have, you know, commit suicide, mm-hmm. um, who've OD'd and yeah. like, I feel like these things could have been preventable. hundred percent, right? man. Yeah. And I, I, I'm in the exact same boat as you, man. People that I've grown up with people that, you know, I looked up to tons of different yeah. things like that. And you know, it's, it's crazy because we always think afterwards, like, oh, I should have known something was up. I should have maybe reached out a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And it's such a fine line because, 
you know, I've, I've had, you know, friends that have struggled with addiction and you can try and help, you know, as much as possible. And sometimes it's just like, kind of like hitting your head against a brick wall. And, and then sometimes you try and help someone and it does work. Yeah. Right. What, so it's such yeah. a weird gray area. It totally is because I, yeah, same things happen with me. I've tried to help people. I've tried to help people and, and ultimately you, you can't help them till they help want to help themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. But that doesn't mean that we can't try because just naturally, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I th- I'd like to think I'm a healer and I like helping people and I like talking to people. Mm-hmm. Um, so naturally I'm not just, if I have a friend that's addicted, like going down a rough road, I'm not just going to like take a blind eye to it. I'm mm-hmm. going to try to help him and try to help him. Right. But ultimately, um, they do have to help themselves at some point. They have to want it. How would you say like, cause I'm assuming that you had people reach out to you when you were hurting pretty bad. Like, do you know like what kind of made the difference between the times where people would reach out and you'd kind of react negatively or the times you'd react positively? Do you know, like, I I guess like a better question is like, what's a good approach to kind of go about reaching out to someone who you think might need a bit of help? Yeah, that's a good question. I know when I was going through a rough time, you don't want to like step on their toes or insult them. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. When I was going through a rough time, I didn't always like um, people reaching out, especially if they were telling me what I was doing was wrong. Mm-hmm. Like you're partying too much. You're doing, you're going down a rough path. You're doing this and that. And especially because the, the, the chemicals in my brain were off. I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like I'm on top of the world right now. Mm-hmm. Like I'm so happy. I'm, I love life, but it was all, it was just a mask. Right. So to answer your question to how, how to reach out to people. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't necessarily know what the right way is. I know that, um, you know, just, just the basic questions, like just the basic questions when someone, when, when I get, sometimes some of my friends will tell me like, Oh, this, this other friend is like, he's been drinking every day or he's been doing this and that. And I'll, I'll reach out to them, but I don't want them to know that I kind of got tipped off about Mm -hmm. it tipped Mm -hmm. off not ticked off yeah Um, yeah yeah so i'll i'll reach out i'll reach out to them and i'll just be like hey like how you been what's new like how's life been like are you are you healthy these days Mm -hmm. um and i'll just i'll just get to asking questions and i can't pry the truth out of them um but i feel like i feel like it's at least giving them the open to talk to me right? right breaking that ice with them is is it's always worth a try Right. So just kind of staying connected in general. Yeah. Just staying exactly. Just staying connected with them. Um, because a lot of time they, they want to dis they want to disconnect from everything in the world and they just want to like be in their house with all the blinds closed and depressed and not talk to anybody. But we know that that's not going to help. No, man. We know that that doesn't get, that doesn't, that doesn't usually get anywhere. Yeah, right? absolutely not, man. It's definitely you good gotta, to have like reflection time, but just sitting there ruminating and thinking bad thoughts over and over again is not going to help. Right. Yeah, it's, it's okay to have alone time and it's okay to have that time to think for sure, but you can only spend so much time in your room with the blinds closed, like depressed with a bottle. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Eventually you got to open the blinds and like let the sun in and like be around people that are going to make you laugh and remind you how beautiful life is 100 percent, man right and like what kind of because like you said you had like little reaches when you were kind of you know struggling quite a bit what was like the main the main time where you're like okay i'm was there like one time where you're like okay i'm just gonna fully reach out like i'm gonna take this situation and just deal with it like face on did you have anything like that yeah no like a realization I mean, not, or yeah i was just i was going down a really rough road and there was a few things that like really just kind of snapped for me and i was like what am i doing with my life okay you know like one of the last straws for me was it was my birthday um and my mom like organized this beautiful barbecue for me at her place and in maple ridge and uh 
you know, my family was all there waiting for me. And I was out partying the night before. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I didn't stop partying all night. It was morning and I was still partying. I was at my house with some friends and we're still going from the night before. And I'm supposed to be at my birthday barbecue at like noon or one or something. And I didn't go. I, 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 I did. I called like two, three hours late. She was texting me, blowing up my phone. Like, are you okay? Where are you? Finally I called and I like pretended to be all tired and I'm like, Oh, I'm not feeling good. Like I'm super sick. I'm sorry. Like I'm not going to make it. And then I hung up the phone and like got right to straight back to partying with my friends. Mm -hmm. And my whole family was like in Maple Ridge, like all waiting for me to get there. Wow. And, uh, and it's mother's day. Wow. This is we're on mother's day here. Like my birthday is a day away from mother's day and they were doing my birthday barbecue on mother's day. And I'm like, how, how like selfish of me was that? You know what I mean? I wasn't thinking about anyone else, mm -hmm. but myself. Yeah, and so that was my, a bit of a wake-up call. Yeah, my dog is sitting here looking at me like, just like not wanting to play with me, kind of like giving me a side eye. And he's just like, you're a loser, dad. You know what I mean? Mm. And I just like looked down at him and I looked at my friends and I was just like, it didn't all snap there, but they ended up going home. And then like I had to, I obviously had to tackle the situation with my family my family ended up getting in a fight because I didn't show up. They got in a bit of an argument. My mom was defending me and, you know, it was just, it was a bit messy. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I was just like, what am I, what am I doing with my life? Like I'm letting down my family and my friends and my dog mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, all the people in my life that love me the most. Mm -hmm. But you, um, but you so knew that there was like a, a, a light there though, man. Like you knew that you had like hope to fix it, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure I did. And I knew that I had, I knew I had good friends and I was seeing other friends. It almost helped that I was seeing other friends go down really rough roads as well. Mm -hmm. And in the last few years, I lost a couple friends. Um, yeah, thank you. And then... Um, and then I, I just turned it around and I, you know what, I ended up starting to work in a couple treatment centers and yeah. that really helped because I all of a sudden became like a mentor to like guys that were just like me mm -hmm. and I was working in this house and I was, you know, a bit of an older guy to them and they like, they kind of looked up to me and I was, and I, and it felt really, really cool. Cause like I was listening to their stories, they're listening to mine and they were like, they were seeing that there's light on the other side of the tunnel. Like I was healthy and I was loving life. And so getting to work with them really helped. Um, yeah, that, that definitely really helped getting to work in the recovery houses, um, having my mother as, you know, as an addictions counselor, having my family doctor and having some, some sober friends, one of my sober friends. And actually I should have mentioned him earlier. Um, he, he was one of the ones that reached out to me. And we had a huge falling out years back. We lived together and he got into alcohol and drugs and we got in a huge falling out. We weren't friends for years and he became like a severe addict addict. And then he cleaned up his life. We didn't talk for years. And then out of the blue, he reached out to me and he said, Hey, can we do lunch? And I was, I didn't have any ill will towards him. We just didn't talk because we got in a couple scraps, um, arguments and we went our own ways. And I was like, of course, like, let's go for coffee. And it was such a surprise to hear from him because I hadn't heard from him for about five years. Mm -hmm. And we went for coffee and he was like, and he was like, so like the, the reason I actually wanted to go for coffee with you was because I wanted to make amends and I wanted to apologize for how I was in the past. And I was like blown away. And I was like, dude, like you don't need to apologize, man. Like I'm not angry at you. He's like, I know, but it's, it's part of the program and it's part of what I got to do. And, and I'm sincerely, I'm sincerely sorely, sorry. And I really, you know, and it was really cool. We've been, we've been connected ever since again. That's and so he's 11 years, he's 11 years sober. Wow. Yeah. And you know, he's doing great. And uh, so the longer I have gone on this journey, the more I surround myself with people who are sober and healthy and comfortable talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's also part of aging and getting older. 
Mm-hmm. You know, what? when I hang up the phone with my, my buddies, I say, I love you now. Yeah, man. And five years ago, 10 years ago, we wouldn't say that. We, we thought that was weird for guys to, buddies to say, I love you when you get off the phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and now it's just normal. But bro, love you, bro. Like, take care, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all good, yeah. man. We just, we do love each other. We're, 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 we're all good friends, you know? Yeah, of course. It's normal yeah. to say that. Yeah, of course. So People that you love. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all, it's all been like just a part of maturity and a part of like a part of this beautiful uh, process of like learning who your true friends are, learning what's good for you in life um, and learning like to, to talk about your problems, to talk about your anxieties, to talk about your stresses, to talk about your depression and knowing, learning how to deal with it, knowing, how, knowing when those things start coming, the small signs um, what to do before they get full blown. Mm-hmm. One thing I've so like actually, if I start... sorry, sorry, you go, yeah, go, ahead. go. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I keep cutting you off, man. I was going to say, no, one thing no. I, one thing I've noticed from listening to you, uh, this is something like, obviously it's been told to me so many times. And I think like everyone's heard this before. It's going to kind of sound like so rudimentary or elementary right now. But one thing I'm mm. noticing from each one of your stories is the more we, or I guess the more I noticed that you were making decisions that, you know, were mostly focused around yourself, the more like negative the impact was. And the more you focused your energy, like every time you tell a positive story, it ends with, you know, you were helping somebody or you were trying to reach out or give some sort of joy away. Like it, it wasn't about mm-hmm. like taking joy. It was about giving joy. And that's where you seemed like you were smiling the most and you know, happy the most, like it seems like such a elementary or rudimentary principle, but that's just like the biggest message I've kind of gotten so far from this conversation, man, is like, that's the best way to kind of get your own happiness is to push happiness. Uh, That's a huge compliment, man. Thank you. And I totally agree. Um, And you know, some of, some of like, some of these um, inspirational talkers, I Tony Robbins and like all these other guys, one of the main things they say in life is like, they say sweat every day, read books. Um, but one of the main things they always say is help other people. Mm-hmm. One of the best things we can do, not, o- not only for ourselves, for the world, and just this ripple effect is just help other people. Right. And it doesn't always have to be monetarily. Like you don't have to just give them no. money or help them at work. Yeah, no, no. A cool little story and I wasn't going to share it with, with, with anyone. I didn't put it on social media or anything. Um, but this 93 year old lady, she lives a few houses down from me. Mm-hmm. And she was walking by her house the other day and she, she's, she was like, Oh, your, your lawn looks so beautiful. Actually, this story goes back about four or five years ago. This, there was an old man, a few houses down and he's trying mm-hmm. to scrape the ice in front of his house. Mm-hmm. And I, and I was walking my dog and I was like, Hey, do you need help with that? And he was like, uh, yes, please. So I ran home, grabbed my shovel. Mm-hmm. I scooped his whole walkway. Wow. And he was, and he, and I, yeah. And he was so, he was so appreciative. Never spoke to him again. That was about five years ago. Mm-hmm. Now fast forward to a couple weeks ago, this 93 year old lady's walking by her house and she's looking at our, she's looking at our lawn and stuff. And I'm like, hi there. And she's like, Oh, hello. She's like, uh, you have a beautiful lawn. And I'm like, Oh, thank you so much. And she's like, I'm 93 years old. And I'm like, Oh my God. Like we just, she was this cute old lady. Right. And she, and she was like, Oh, she's like, she's like, I think years ago you helped my son shovel the snow. And I was like, Oh my God, you live four houses down. And she's like, yeah. So it was actually, I'd never met her before. But it was actually her son, and her son is probably about sixty-five. So he's right. he's an old man, right? He's an older yeah. man as well, right? Wow. And I was like, oh my god, yes. And I'm like, and I'm like, and she's like, well, you have a beautiful lawn, and I was like, thank you very much. I'm like, do you want me to come mow your lawn? And she was like, are you serious? Like that would be amazing. I I'll pay you. And I was like, no, 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 no. like I'm not gonna accept money. And she's like, yeah, I'd love that. And I'm like, okay, in the next three days, I'll come mow your lawn. And so uh, a day went by, two days went by. It was a bit rainy, overcast. I went over there finally and mowed her lawn. 
That's her and her son came out and they tried to give me money. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm not going to accept your money. Mm-hmm. They had to give me something. They just had to. So they, they went in the house and got, grabbed this little cake and they brought it out. And it would have been rude um, for me not to accept it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, so I took the cake and, uh, and anyways, it was just, it was a cool little story of just like, of helping, just helping yeah. someone for no reason, just because this, this like cycle of life, mm-hmm. it, we, we make the world a better place just by helping other people mm-hmm. and you doing this, you doing this podcast sounds like you're doing your part. Um, it sounds like, you know, you've, you, we both struggled with anxiety and depression and similar to, um, sobriety as like me being in that trap before. Now that I'm out, I know how important it is to help other people get out. Mm -hmm. So like, I really appreciate that you're holding this platform now. Um, and, and I don't know how to get it to as many people as possible or how to get more people um, realizing that it's okay to like to talk to us or talk to other people about their anxieties and depressions. And these are normal, normal parts of life that, you know, that hopefully we can all just learn to tackle and and deal with. Yeah, man, a hundred percent. And that's actually, I appreciate you kind of saying that as well, because that, that is the reason of, you know, starting this whole kind of program that I have going because Mm -hmm. the biggest problem for me was just kind of, you know, first, identifying my issue and then kind of learning about it and then mm. you know just reaching out about it i didn't actually mm. like got like get get it in me to you know mm. reach out until you know it, it could have been too late you know there's a lot of things that could happen that could have been a yeah. lot worse and i'm blessed yeah. to be as healthy and 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 happy and grateful as i am now but you know yeah. i i really wish that you know, when i was like 12 13 14 I had, yeah. you know, seen someone speak up about these things and kind of, you know, do it in a manner that was authentic and wasn't just like a, mm-hmm. you know, a doctor in a lab coat telling you, oh, today we're going to talk about mental health. Like, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I wish that there was some sort of a, a way I could have learned about it and seen that, you know, it wasn't uncool to speak about these things because, yeah. you know, struggles are struggles. Everyone has them. It is what it is. Yeah. And, you can argue about, you know, whose struggles are worse or whose struggles are harder to overcome. But at the end of the day, we all deal with something. Yeah. So like it doesn't do. matter what you've dealt with or what I've dealt with, or, you know, what our friends maybe have dealt with, we can all still try and help each other. A hundred percent. Speaking man. about it is going to make it better. A hundred percent. I agree. It will. It will. The first thing is talking about it. And that's one of the big things that's been going on with, with this black lives matter stuff right now is just like, conversation Mm -hmm. that's like such an important part is just like starting the conversation i've been hearing that a lot floating around is like just start the conversation because that's the first step yeah just talk about anything like i think that everyone should be able to talk about whatever they're struggling with yeah you shouldn't be ridiculed because you know maybe they're having an issue and they think that maybe someone else's issue might be worse or someone else you know might think that their issue whatever it is man at the Mm. end of the day like you said, start the conversation. We should be able to speak about things that, you know, are are hurting us or, you know, it's stuck in our head. Right. Mm, mm. Well, I want you to know that if you're ever going through a rough time, I'm always here for you, man. Bless man. Thank you so much. Yeah. You as well. You know, if you ever, if anything's ever up, if you're ever down, if you ever, uh, if you ever feel like you need to speak to someone, um, I'm always here for you, man. You've been nothing but like this amazing guy ever since I met you. I appreciate um, that, man. Your energy is always amazing. You know, it's always it's always good to see you in the gym. And uh, my girlfriend said she's seen you a few times in the gym. And you've always said hi to her. And once she she didn't really recognize you, and she felt all awkward. And then she, you know, she felt bad. I changed my look too much, man. I changed yeah, my you look do. too much. Everyone you says do. that. It's, yeah. a, it's this weird thing I do, man. When I when I want to make a big change about my personality or something else, I have to do a physical change as well, man. Yeah, well, you look you look great, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. Look you great, as well. and I'm and uh, and I'm always here for you, man. And and uh, yeah, I love love this 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 whole chat. It's it's great, man. Thank you, man. I think that's a beautiful way to wrap it up. But uh, before you go, my number one requirement for everybody before you leave and we say goodbye, you have mm. to give a positive message to the people. Oh man, 
<laughs> one more. I know you've kind of been doing it this whole time, but you just have to do it. Put a little bow on top, man. One little, yeah. one little kiss just to end it off. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds so cliche, but I think the most, it, 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 the most important thing, man, is just do the things you love in life. Just mm. do more of the things you love in life. And one of the main things that I've, I've started doing in the last few years is writing bucket lists um, because life will just pass you by, man. Yes. And when you're doing the things you love, nothing else matters, man. And that, and that goes for work. That goes for like the people you hang out with, the things you're doing, healthy habits and do the things you love. Just set, set a list of like goals of things you've always wanted to do, countries you want to go to, things you want to do. If you've ever wanted to skydive or bungee jump or ride in a, you know, in a float plane or just random things, those are just things that have been on my list, right? But everyone has these, you know, everyone's different and everyone has crazy things that they want to do but they're too scared or they just don't think that they could ever do it mm -hmm. and uh and yeah just do the things you love beautiful man well that's uh i couldn't think of a better message to end this one off with man thank you so yeah. much it's john hutch right here thank you so much brother peace out i, I appreciate your time man peace no, and i look you. forward to seeing you soon you as well man